Hello and welcome to Somerville Neighborhood News. I'm Monica Akhtar. And I'm Andrew McLeod. Today is November 26th. Somerville Neighborhood News is a community service production of SCAT TV put together by staff, interns, and your neighbors. We bring you the news every two weeks right here on Channel 3 and on our website, scattvsomerville.org, where you can watch the news in your language. That's right. With just a few clicks, you can see this newscast with subtitles. Tonight, our reporters bring you stories on the McGrath Highway, Somerville's bikeability, Tufts payments to the city, and our veterans. But first, let's look at the big news from the past two weeks. A few weeks ago, we reported on a campaign to raise the minimum wage. Well, just last week, the Massachusetts Senate voted to hike wages up to $11 an hour by 2016. We'll be watching to see how our representatives vote. Somerville boys soccer came this close to winning the Division I state championship. Congratulations to the team, parents, and coaches for a great season. The redevelopment of Union Square has hit the press. WBUR and Somerville Media did stories on changes that are in store, including properties being taken by eminent domain. We'll be sure to explore this in future programs. The McGrath Highway is the road that nobody loves. The state is planning to take down the overpass portion and turn it into a city street. But that work will take at least 10 years. In the meantime, some short-term improvements are slated to begin next spring. Dan Reiner reports. The state says it will take 10 years or more to bring the entire McGrath down to ground level. The short-term safety improvements are slated for next spring. The public got a glimpse of the plans at a November 13th meeting at the Argenzano School, with presentations by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation and their consultants. Some big names in the audience included former Transportation Secretary Fred Salvucci and State Rep Tim Toomey. Mass DOT officials and consultants presented the plans and took questions and a little heat from the audience. There is a commitment to, to ground McGrath um, at some point in the future. We're not here tonight to talk about grounding McGrath. Grounding McGrath is a, a parallel initiative to what we're doing here, and I think it's, it's consumed a lot of the energy up to this point. What we're here to talk about tonight is what can we do now to give some much needed investment to this area surrounding the elevated portion of McGrath Highway and McCarthy Overpass. There are really three components, um, and we'll get into each one of them. There's the closure of the down ramp, which here's McGrath Highway coming through, now down towards Cambridge, and we'll get into why. But the, that, that ramp in the current uh, operations there presents a lot of safety and operational deficiencies. Another point was the addressing essentially the tunnel, as we come to call it, which is the you know, the passageway beneath the elevated structure that gets people up to Washington Street, and is there a way to improve upon that? Uh, and in that, is there a way to maybe do some things that are to the advantage to the brick bottom neighborhood, which is currently uh, pretty much cut off from the rest of Somerville? And finally, and I think, you know, I don't want to say most importantly, but certainly not a secondary component of this, is significant pedestrian and bicycle improvements. The audience had questions and some good advice of their own. And the advantage of switching the bike lanes to the inside, to the curb, is you can then actually have that raised area include the bike lane through the intersection, which makes a little bit more of a table, which is also good for pedestrians if there's no bikes there. From, from what we have today to what we can have by the, you know, the end of next summer, the beginning of uh, next fall after this project is completed, will just be just a, you know, a real step above uh, what we have presently. You know, anytime you come to a community and you talk about fixing a bridge that nobody wants, it takes courage. So <laughs> we appreciate that. I mean, there is a new urbanist vibe in the air. Um, it's bigger than us in this discussion. It's not political. It's simply, I think, playing out quite a bit in Somerville's ground zero amongst some other communities around here. The final details still need to be worked out, but when it comes to the McGrath, any change is an improvement. In Somerville, I'm Dan Reiner for Somerville Neighborhood News. 
Earlier this month, ESPN Sports Center featured our very own Somerville High soccer team. The cameraman, senior Anthony Screma, tells how he got the network to pay attention to this incredible goal. I was actually filming the game for the soccer team and, you know, Tyrone was, was one of their best players and he did an amazing thing which is called a bicycle kick where you basically almost do a backflip and you kick the ball without even looking at the goal and he scored. Shit. The whole crowd was going wild and I said to the person next to me, I have to get on SportsCenter. So I go home, I put all the film together, I, I usually send the goals to the team and let them see like them scoring and then I took this one special goal and put it as a separate video on YouTube and um, Sports Center does this thing where if you tweet with the hashtag SC Top 10, standing for Sports Center Top 10, um, and it's, if it gets trending, they'll see it, and then if they like it, they'll put it on Top 10. So my goal was get this video wherever you could. I posted it, and I'm like, guys, share this, put it on Twitter, tweet with this hashtag, and then it just went from there. Everybody shared it on Facebook, and if you went on Twitter, Everybody's Twitter was filled up with that. So shortly, I got an email for, from uh, ESPN Assignment Desk, which is uh, for e a Sports Center, and they're like, "We want permission to use this clip," and I was, of course, with it. Look at this, and I can't get it. Bring it to Somerville Lumba. So, um, yeah, I post. This is the actual video. Right now, it's at 4,800 views, and it's only been about two days. That video now has almost 7,000 hits. Wow, teens are so great with social media. People must flip out when they see this. Last month, the city of Somerville announced a new five-year agreement with Tufts. Tufts will pay the city $275,000 per year. That's $100,000 more than the previous agreement. Tufts makes a number of contributions to Somerville, like running a homework help workshop and other programs but this money will be much needed revenue for the cash-strapped city. Many universities, hospitals, and other large nonprofits make such payments to the cities and towns where they are located. Most of them call these payments a pilot, which means payment in lieu of taxes, because they don't have to pay real estate taxes on most or all of their property. Somerville Neighborhood News Director Jane Regan takes a look at the new agreement. Tufts payment is part of the university's partnership with the cities of Medford and Somerville, but Tufts doesn't call its payment a pilot. I wanted to find out why and also to find out more about pilots in general. I started my research at the Lincoln Land Institute, a recognized authority on pilots. One of the rationales for a pilot is that the city is providing police protection, fire protection, uh, street cleaning, snow removal, all those services carry a cost, so, and the nonprofit uses them, but are not paying for them in property taxes, unlike other taxpayers. There are some problems with pilots. They tend to be negotiated in ad hoc ways. So there's no real rhyme or reason for how much uh, different nonprofits are paying, and they can be contentious sometimes and sour important relationships between the nonprofit and the local government. That's what happened when State Representative Denise Provo supported a bill that would make pilots mandatory for all private institutions of higher education. The bill did not pass. This is an issue all over the country. So it's a, it's a perennial problem um, in communities where there is a lot of land that's owned by a nonprofit organization that's exempt from pay, paying the property tax. Tufts University has about $286 million worth of tax-exempt property in Somerville. If Tufts had to pay taxes on that property, it would owe the city about $5.8 million in 2014. Langley calls the exemption from local taxes a geographic mismatch. There's this major geographic mismatch between the benefits and costs of the exemption. The benefits of charitable activities like educating students, like uh, in providing research, are very widely dispersed throughout the nation and throughout the entire world. It makes sense that our country wants to subsidize those activities. 
But at the local level with the property tax exemption, the cost is borne entirely by city residents and those benefits do not stop at city borders. In Boston, a task force determined how much large nonprofits should pay. Their main uh, recommendations are first of all that all nonprofits above a certain size should pay 25% of what they would owe in property taxes if they're taxable. So that's the first main recommendation. And the second one is that they included services provided by nonprofits in their formula so that uh, colleges and hospitals can reduce their cash pilot uh, to the extent that they're providing services to the city. How do Tufts, Harvard, BU, and other institutions measure up? It's hard to compare them exactly because of differing endowments, different student bodies, etc. In Boston, many have now raised their pilot payments, like BU, which has about the same endowment as Tufts. In 2013, BU paid almost 20% of what it would owe, over $6 million in cash and another $6 million in services. For its Boston properties, Tufts paid about 15% of what it would owe, with $375,000 in cash, representing over 7% of what it would owe that city. But in Somerville, Tufts pays only 4.7% of what it would owe. Still, Langley thinks the Tufts payment isn't too bad. My overall impression is positive. I think that the amount that Tufts is paying is within the range that I would expect from an institution like that in this region. Certainly it's not a huge percentage of what they would owe if they are taxable. I, it, it seems very low to me, um, especially considering, for instance, Tufts is going to be getting a brand new Green Line station at its front door. I think it would probably be helpful if dispassionate individuals could come up with some kind of formula for figuring out what is fair for any given institution, recognizing that they differ a lot. If Tufts were to pay 25% of what it would owe in property taxes, it would have to pay the city about $1.45 million in 2014. Asked about this formula, Tufts said, each city will have its own approach to working with tax-exempt institutions. Somerville has not adopted the approach Boston uses. We greatly appreciate Mayor Curtitoni's willingness to work with Tufts on what is reasonable while still increasing the university's annual payments and adding new benefits around college admission for Somerville High School students and playing fields for youth soccer. I never found out exactly why Tufts doesn't call its payments pilots. But in any case, as cities and towns continue to struggle to make ends meet, the debate over how much nonprofits should pay host communities for the fact that they get out of paying property taxes, no matter what you call the payments, is not going away anytime soon. For Somerville Neighborhood News, I'm Jane Regan. I had no idea that nonprofits got a property tax exemption. Have you noticed that Somerville has a lot more bikers lately? Well, the city just got a great ranking for its bikeability. Kami Wood brings us more. In October, Somerville was named a silver bicycle-friendly community by the League of American Bicyclists. This award, uh, it recognizes that we are making progress in terms of infrastructure and also in terms of, of programming. Um, and really working towards achieving some of the goals set out in the comprehensive plan. Two years ago, Somerville was awarded the bronze. So the 20 miles of cycling markers like bike lanes that have been added since 2010 have certainly made a difference. We are also working on a number of projects that will further improve that infrastructure, such as the extension of the community path, um, both the phase that's currently under the construction and the phase that's in planning along with the Green Line extension. In the past few years, the number of bicyclists has gone up significantly, but Somerville still has a ways to go. But there are still areas that, that are a little hostile, some very hostile, frankly, and where a lot of people aren't comfortable biking. 
powder house circle comes to mind. This is probably the toughest nut to crack as far as a really messy, scary intersection in Somerville. Um, it's neither a, a roundabout, nor a rotary, nor a proper stop controlled, nor traffic signal controlled intersection. It's a Frankenstein of an intersection. Bikers also say other tough spots include Broadway at Foss Park and Washington under the McGrath Highway. As far as I know, the city's been paying attention to all of them. It's just they're in different stages of getting uh, improved. Many bikers are not convinced that Somerville is silver medal ready, but the recent awards show the improvements the city has made thus far. Reporting for Somerville Neighborhood News, I'm Kami Wood. We decided to ask bikers what they thought about the silver medal. Do you think that Somerville is bicycle friendly? Yeah, I definitely think so, like with all the bike lanes, and I feel like a lot of the cars are aware of it, and um, like, they definitely like slow down when you're biking. Parts of it are. Um, I live at Border Square. I used to live in Union Square this summer, so certain streets are a lot more friendly, like this has a bike path. Um, but people drive pretty aggressively on this street. It's certainly more friendly than other cities I've lived in. I mean, any, if you go to the, any of the back neighborhoods, like it's good. You know, it's yeah. pretty open. Um, I think as a driver, it's bicycle friendly, but it makes it very difficult to maneuver through the roads uh, with the bikes here. A lot of people don't follow the rules of the road. What would you rate Somerville then? Would you rate it a gold, silver, copper? What are the standards? Like, can I give worse than 10? Well, there's always room for improvement, so I don't know what those terms mean, but I'd put it, I guess silver's as good as anything, somewhere in between. I'd say Somerville might compare it, might be like copper. I would say a 10. I don't know, I haven't had any problems yet. Uh, when I ride here, as I just did, I get into the middle of the lane where the bike symbols are, and I don't have people on my tail, and I don't have people, you know, doing illegal things as frequently as they do in other places. Somerville has so many interesting people doing interesting things. Our next segment will really amaze you. Nervous System is an experimental design studio. We focus on using techniques from science and mathematics, but for design. So we produce software and use that software to generate products that are essentially grown in the computer using scientific and mathematical algorithms that are inspired by how things grow in nature. At Nervous System, we work with a few different manufacturing techniques. One of the techniques that there's a lot of buzz about right now is 3D printing. We also work with laser cutting, um, which is like the opposite thing. It's subtractive machining. So you've got a piece of material and you're using laser to carve out sections of it, remove material rather than adding stuff. We sell a lot of jewelry, that's how we sort of started out, but we're pretty product agnostic. We just sort of make whatever we think is interesting and fun. So we make jigsaw puzzles, we make lighting, we make some furniture. One of our main things at Nervous System is thinking about how we can sort of replace mass manufacturing, which encourages people to have like uh, millions of units manufactured of exactly one design with a method that allows us to make customized one-of-a-kind objects. Rather than designing individual objects, we're designing systems that can create an infinite variety of objects. And instead of just using those ourselves and making designs that we can sell, we create versions that anybody can use online to design their own products. The target user of our online applications are people who are not designers, who don't have any experience with 3D modeling or 3D printing or really making anything at all. They're designed to just be fun, playful tools that you can experiment with that sort of suck you in and get you to design stuff, even though that might not be your initial inclination. When somebody places an order on our website for a custom piece, then we send it to Shapeways to 3D print. So they're a 3D printing company in New York. They'll print the part and get it back to us. We dye them different colors based on what the customer requested. We spray coat them with a protective coating and then we package them and ship them to customers. We're not just exploring customization or generating unique products using algorithms, but we're making it really, really easy 
for anybody to both buy the products and play with the processes. You never really know what's going on inside some of these ordinary looking buildings until you go in. Next up, Dan Atkinson, editor of the Somerville Journal, fills us in on the most important issues he'll be following this week. Hello, it's going to be a somewhat quieter week this week with Thanksgiving, but there's still plenty of news happening in Somerville. Uh, the Journal is going to take a look at a new proposal to put GPS devices in all city-owned vehicles, uh, as well as following up on what happened to a proposal to eliminate the 48-hour parking rule. And we'll also be checking in with a bunch of local writers who have been participating in National Novel Writing Month this past November. So check out the Somerville Journal. It hits these stands on November 28th, and you can always look at wickedlocal.com slash Somerville and get in touch with us through uh, D. Atkinson at wickedlocal.com or 617-629-3385. Thanks. Earlier this month, Somerville celebrated Veterans Day. Monica, you have a report for us, right? Somerville celebrated their veterans this month with multiple events throughout the city. Vets were honored with a wreath and the unveiling of a new chair dedicated to prisoners of war. By establishing a permanent display here in City Hall, we will remind the public to keep our, not only our captured and missing personnel in our hearts, but also their families. That patriotic people make this kind of sacrifice every, every day, every week, every year, um, because that's the price of, of maintaining freedom and democracy for the luckiest people in the world. And I thank all of you veterans for making us the luckiest people in the world. And what do you think about this chair being put in place here in Somerville? Well, I'm happy to see it. You know, it reminds me of a, a boy I went to school with, uh, George Schiapani. He was in the 24th Division. He was taken prisoner of war uh, early in the conflict. And uh, he died as a result of lack of, uh, of uh, medical treatment, you know, which uh, the North Koreans weren't, weren't too keen about treating our prisoners or anything. He died, he died in captivity. About 2,700 veterans reside in Somerville. The city provides many services for those returning soldiers. A lot of the older veterans um, play a big role in what the city's um, what the city actually does. And the, a lot of the veterans, like today's ceremony and the museum, um, that was all because of Larry Wilworth that we all got involved. So I think the veterans community, along with Jay Weaver, who runs the veteran services in Somerville, is the, have been fantastic and just gets better every year. Despite these services, many veterans still suffer from homelessness, joblessness, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Nationally, an estimated 18 veterans per day take their own lives. And this year, more veterans' lives were lost by suicide than by combat. And you can look at our VA system, how screwed up it is, and they can't get medicine and everything else. They can, they can physic, uh, fix it physically, but they can't fix it mentally. And this is what's happening some of that. They're getting pushed to a side. They give them a pill, say, okay, you'll be fine, mellow out and sit in the corner. You go do one-on-one. -on -one. If a veteran wants to talk to someone, really, they don't need to talk to a shrink. Talk to someone else that's been in that situation, and they can talk better. That's better than medicine. To date, the federal government has budgeted $1.5 trillion to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. At the same time, the VA is unable to provide returning veterans with fully adequate treatment. Uh, those in Washington should think twice about, you know, committing our sons and daughters uh, in these these brush fire wars or things that are going on within their countries and everything. Still, those who take part in the veteran services community find a unique sense of camaraderie and understanding among their veteran brothers and sisters. What can you say to another veteran? You can look in the eye and you don't have to say anything. Veteran knows a veteran. It doesn't matter. There's a little twinkle in their eye that doesn't go away. The names listed behind me are the Somerville residents who died serving our country. Reporting for Somerville Neighborhood News, I'm Monica Akhtar. 
To learn more about Somerville's veterans, I invited Mark Alston Follinsby, Executive Director of Somerville Homeless Coalition and a veteran himself, into the studio. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate you joining us. You have a really unique um, perspective to share with us. I know you're a Vietnam veteran, is that right? That's correct. And now you are Executive Director of Somerville Homeless Coalition? Yes. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I first want to talk a little bit about how returning home after war is so different for different veterans, and I w want to ask you how it was for you. I was uh, traumatized by the experience in Vietnam. In, in many ways, I was very lucky, but uh, I had planned on a career as a journalist. I never wanted to write another story or take another photograph. Uh, and in fact, as soon as I got out of the Army, I went and hid out in the woods for six years. Um, you know, we were not uh, supported when we came back from Vietnam. We were looked at as, you know, child killers. I, don't, I never had anybody spit on me, but there was this, you know, general impression that, you know, we were the bad guys because, you know, we had been soldiers in Vietnam. And I know many veterans suffer from homelessness and joblessness, and there's a high rate of suicide. Can you shed some light on those issues for us? I didn't really know much about homelessness until I moved to Somerville, uh, Cambridge in 1985. And I started talking to people on the street when they would ask me for money because there was something about them that felt so familiar. And uh, most of them were veterans and I got angry that they were homeless because they were traumatized from the experiences that they had. And I knew that it was only because of the support I had from my family and friends when I came back that I didn't end up that way too. Um, you know, trauma affects different people in different ways, and it's, it isn't just veterans that have PTSD, although a lot of the work about uh, PTSD has been done with veterans groups. But uh, anybody who's been in a, some kind of a tragic, traumatic experience, you know, women who ex uh, experience sexual abuse or sexual violence or people who are in horrific accidents. But, um, you know, this is one subpopulation that has a disproportionate number of homeless people because of the trauma they experience. It's probably a common denominator among the homeless, you know, is that these are people who are traumatized and have somehow lost the supports that most of us depend upon. Good. And can you tell me a little bit about the rate of suicide and how that, um, is that for, from a lack of resources from when they return home that we can't take care of them the right way? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, everybody is different. I think that one of the the difficult things about PTSD is you can come home. I know people that came home from Vietnam, got jobs, had families, you know, bought houses. Right. I know we have actually some great services in the city. Um, we have veteran services and the VA. Is there a difference there in, in terms of how they take care of our veterans? So veteran services really focus on immediate needs here in the community and can give people some small cash assistance and other kinds of support. The VA is really where veterans turn to for things like health care, uh, and the difficulty is that the VA doesn't have enough beds, enough resources to help everybody that needs them. That's why, in, in my opinion, the suicide rate is as high as it is. Wow, I've learned so much. Thank you for sharing with us. And I wish we had time to learn more, but unfortunately we're out of time. But I'd just like to thank you once again for being with You're us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back on December 10th. Remember that you can watch Somerville Neighborhood News anytime on our website where you can view the news with subtitles in 44 different languages. If you want to get involved or if you have any story ideas, drop us a line at news at scattvsomerville.org. Soccer shot was amazing. Oh, amazing.